Hello and welcome back to the session on coaching and context. Yeah. I must apologize for the timer. That was me assuming it was off. So thank you for living with that, that problem. I appreciate that. So yeah, what did you talk about? Anyone? Yeah, Helena, hello. That as a rookie coach, not getting context meant I was taken for a complete ride. <laughs> I was totally gullible and believed everything my client told me, hook, line, and sinker. Ah. Wow, thank you for that. That's a great learning to start this session <laughs> off. Oh, context really, really is important. Wow, thank you for that. Yeah, any other comments? Who's up for a comment? Okay, I'll go. Yeah? Yeah, um, we, we spoke about the context of the client when they take the assessments whether it's the enneagram or the maturity assessment mm. um and there were a couple of case studies where when someone took the test while they were in the work context mm. let's say the company's paying for it then they view their character or personality from the context of how they operate at work mm. but when they take it let's say they're seeing a life coach and it's got nothing to do with work, then the Enneagram or the Enneagram number comes out different. Mm. So, so that's something to kind of look at in terms of context from the side of the, the, the coachee. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question because um, it shouldn't. Um, you know, hmm. Uh, you know, we, so from our side, it shouldn't do that. What, we, we, you know, it should still be revealing um, similar threads and trends. So that is something to look into. And it's all about how people answer as well. Yeah. Miriam, did you want to come in on that point? Yes. Um. So I, and I had a client recently that did the Enneagram in English mm. and she was assessed at 863 mm. social. And she was like, she asked if she could do it in Spanish because she was not happy with the 863. I said, okay, because she does speak Spanish more than 50% of the time. She assessed at 863 in Spanish. Yeah. However, her two and seven mm. were much higher mm. in Spanish than in English, yeah. which was fascinating. So I asked her, we talked about that. And what she said to me was in English, she thought about it more in terms of business. And in Spanish, she thought about her whole life. And so we started to talk about, and it was a great opening about how she behaves and doesn't support people and slices and dices at the office. She works for an investment and how she treats her friends differently. Hmm. So and it was an opportunity for her to look at. Yeah. It is an opportunity always and something, maybe it's a blind spot of mine around hoping the assessment would look the same from all um, contexts. So maybe that is a blind spot of mine. Um, and that is very interesting, um, especially for people that have, you know, uh, ring fenced lives separate from work. And language would be a way in which that would happen more rigorously, I yeah. imagine. So thank you, both of you, for that. You know, what we find more than the Enneagram is the maturity uh, assessment. And mm -hmm. that might vary 
dependent on whether people have done it on their cell phone, contrary to instructions, because they make very short answers. And um, so it might happen on the phone, they might be assessed at earlier stages, or um, and, and then there's personality types that do other games, but let's not get caught up in, in that one. But thank you for that. So that's also useful, the context of the assessment. So now I'm hoping that this is now. There's one There's yeah. one more thing on that, which was fascinating. I had another client who speaks English, again, 50-50, and she was assessed in the maturity and when as a specializing. And when we started to talk about that, what she said to me was when she speaks English, her sentences are much shorter. And when she speaks Spanish, because I offered her in English or Spanish, and she said, oh, I'll do it in English. She said that she's more eloquent in Spanish. Mm. It was very yeah. interesting. So she was very not happy with the fact that her results were her results in English, because which gave me the answer that she's in the right she was assessed pretty close or thereabout but now I know that with my Spanish speaking clients I need to ask them that question yeah I think that's fascinating you know a professional language and um, that professional language comes from a level of maturity mm -hmm that's what shows up in the assessment versus a whole life mm. very very interesting debate and thank you both for raising raising that i have to take it back to the drawing board sit on it any other questions about i mean any other comments about context and coaching what did you come up with how are you using the context Gail, hi. Jill, Jill, sorry, I'm blind. I should wear glasses and I'm, hot. yeah, okay, there you go. Jill. Thanks. Um, one of the things that came up in our discussion was that, you know, when you aren't in a corporate and you're working just with private clients, you don't have access to 360s or, um, you know, line managers input or whatever. So you get the client's view of the context. Um, and, and we, we wondered, I mean, sometimes all um, views come with a particular lens. Um, and we all know kind of in, in work in corporate, sometimes when you do check in with line managers, the feedback um, or with subordinates, the feedback is different from what the person's telling you. Um, so I think holding that, I mean, one of the techniques they use in competency-based recruitment training or practice is you know looking for country evidence or asking evidence asking questions around the polarities if you're getting a particular view about a client you know was one way of combating that but you know the client's truth is still their truth but it may not offer you the full picture so that was just something we sat with mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah yeah it's quite a complex topic actually mm -hmm. Um, and all these versions of truth and how the client weaves them together. And, and then if you're working in corporate and you're dealing with their boss and all these multiple truths and what context are they actually working in? Any other comments about context? Chantel, no. Oh. Yeah, um, we had an interesting um, discussion about um, if a client is not talking about something contextual, um, do we bring it up? Um, mm -hmm. And I think to your um, to your comment about climate change, you know, there are there are people in our line of work who are quite activist in in what they do, and who will want to bring up climate change, what we talked about was the issue of race. Yeah. If you're coaching um, a, a black person in a white dominated corporate, um, 
Mm. Do you do you bring up the issue of discrimination or whatever? So we had a very interesting discussion about that. Um, how we listen to what the person is saying if they're not speaking about it explicitly, but it's implicit in the way that they see themselves or their sense of agency. Um, how do you, in a nuanced way, still staying with the client and their needs and interests? How do you how do you bring that in? And I think there are many contextual issues we could think about here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Absolutely critical. Um, yeah, very, very important to try and understand how that person is positioned in that particular culture. And um, not everyone's aware of all of the dynamics of that culture, or maybe they're aware and there's a cross-cultural thing. But I'm not going to get into those details now, because I've got quite a lot to say. And the idea with these sessions is that you pop in what you're interested in at any point in the conversation. So thank you for that. What I'm finding interesting is um, the enormous range of contextual issues we have to deal with as a coach, the assessment, then where we do the actual session, what context they bring in, what context we bring in. Um, and frankly, it's all quite mad. So I've dealt with a few things today and some of the um, trends that we are seeing in the world. And hopefully you will find it interesting and challenging. So I wanted to start, because I always love a little bit of an existential start, with the idea or trying to explore the idea what is a human so i've got there jean paul sartre and steve bantu Pico, two different thinkers both existential so i love sartre because you know i like to research stuckness and um, sartre's got some great things to say so he says there's two kinds of beings the one is a a being that in um, that interacts with the environment and grows and learns and changes and the other is a being that stays the same so like a tree a tree is always a tree even when it's a plank i know that sounds foolish but i think you get the picture humans um are defined by the fact that they emerge and change in relation to a context. So Sartre's definition of humanity was that people can emerge and change and adapt and evolve. That's the definition of human. And um, non-human are things that are essentialized, even people that don't change and emerge and grow and have a limited relationship with the context. So that's like a, a very brief summary. Biko spoke about humans internalizing contexts. And through that process of internalizing contexts did change but often became, in my language, amputated or turned into objects. So, so what he spoke about for those that don't know Biko's work in particular was blackness and how under apartheid, black people and blackness had been completely undermined as a concept of no value and how um, in, in order to survive and um, exist under apartheid, black people had discarded blackness. So he speaks about our capacity to emerge and change, but that this capacity can also involve losing part of yourself, the very part that allows you to have a real identity and survive. 
So just two kinds of ways of thinking about this. So Sartre was saying, um, we grow and emerge, and that's how we be human. And Biko is saying that the context can turn us into objects and enable us to lose our humanity. So we can also um, adapt in relation to the context, but that can result in the loss of our very humanity. And so when we come back to Biko a little bit later and explore his ideas of how we can rehumanize ourselves, recontextualize ourselves, then just remember that idea that a context can turn a human into an object. And obviously I'm giving you an incredibly summarized kind of view of the theory, but it's just a kind of a starting point for the discussion today. But the big lesson here is that existential thinkers, humans are humans because they emerge and change. And that when people lose that capacity to emerge and change, they are dehumanized as they can be by an oppressive system. Shout if there are any questions. Just starting with a bit of theory. So there are many aspects of context. And you can really argue whichever perspective you want to argue from. So you can say there are internal contexts inside the coach, inside you as the client, uh, as the, the inside the coach, inside the client, inside the coach's system, inside the client's system. But I think some ways of thinking about it might be as follows. So how big is the context both inside and outside the client? Is the client talking about a big world or small world? Is the client having a small inner world or a big inner world? I mean, these are just ideas to kind of play with. How big is the inner world of the client? How many identities live there? How much agility do they have in the world? You know, this business about how big the context is, is actually really important because when people are under stress, what they often do is make the context very small. And I know you've seen this in old, older people who um, are fearful of the world and the changes in the world. And their way of coping with that is to make the context really small, just down to their kitchen or down to their house, to a world that they can control. It's a way of reducing uncertainty and allowing people to live. But it's very important in terms of how adaptive that person actually is to the environment. Then there's the question of what tense is the clients living in? You know, are they living in a past tense, a present tense, or future tense? You know, when you ask them for stories about their context, which tense is that story in? This is a funny thing. Um, and in some ways, it's like a bit of a no brainer. But we often forget to pick up on this with clients, you know, clients that keep on nostalgically referring to the past, hoping it's going to come back, or clients referring to how things are now, or how they could be in the future. And you can use your Enneagram knowledge as much as you like in this area, because there are some people, some personalities that are going to um, identify more fully with the future, for example. Another aspect of context is what data do people include to talk about the context? Are they talking about technical numbers? Are they talking about feelings? Are they talking about body sensations? What data is being included to create the picture of the context? And this is going to help you get an understanding of how the client engages with the context. Do they engage deeply? Or do they sit a little bit autonomously outside the context? 
how are they engaging with the context and how deeply? And this is something um, I, I want to bring up later with some pretty wild ideas. And you, you can say they're nonsense, but it's this business of how people engage with the context. Because you get some people, you know, I'm just thinking of coaching clients who's like 64, about to uh, retire. And they don't, they might withdraw from the context and become separate from the context, be acontextual. So they don't feel they have to take cues in from the context to keep evolving and adapting. Or are other people really hooked into this volatile context and adapting all the time, so much so that they threaten to fragment. How are you thinking about these ideas? They're making sense to you. Yeah, Jochen. I want to say that um, I'm. I, I can see a pattern, hmm. which is coming from the discussion of the enneagram um, and the extension uh, existentialism, which is there is a human being. And you said, which interacts and emerges and changes with the environment. But the, the assumption is there is a human being. Mm. And there are quite a lot of approaches. We said, no, there's not a human being. Yes. We as human beings are several, depending on in which context we are. Yeah. Um, and we are completely different. Yeah. Whether we get triggered or we get, we are at calm, at peace with ourselves, and, and and in which language we speak, in which culture we are, in which situation we are. So I I would wonder um, whether there is some consideration of the relativity rather than the the mono the mono approach of one being and the environment. Yeah, I think that's great. It gets very complex. So you mean, so also sort of in that world would be someone like Sartre who would say, we don't exist till we interact with the world. And it's through the we and the interaction with the world that we find our identity. And that until we do that, until we have behaviors in response to an environment, we have a nothingness at our core. Um, and th this makes the discussion a lot more complex. And it's definitely, I think, a, a very useful way to think about this. And I would be happy to spend a lot of time talking about the self. But I'd love to just plant that idea now around that, that you've, you've brought in here, Jochen, is um, that, that the self is in many parts. I mean, there's many different schools of psychology that speak to the different parts inside a person and philosophy, and that the self is emergent and that um, is created in discussion with the world. So there's that whole group of people. And then there's also like a lot of Enneagram practitioners who believe that we have some kind of essential core that um, we have to scrape off the muck of our socialization and go in through some sort of archeological exploration to find this pure central core. And so often the debates are polarized around those two points and I don't know how to make sense of it. I personally like the idea that we have a little bit of a central core and then the rest emerges in conversation with the world and that we have multiple components, which is much more of a sort of a beaker idea that we have many aspects of our identity. But do you see how complicated this thing is, is probably going to get? <laughs> so hold on. 
to your horses. Um, and let's just keep those themes rolling in through the discussion. Thank you for that. Right, so I wanted to just pop in a slide at this point around maturity and context. So um, the research on maturity shows that at later stages, people become more contextual. Often at early stages, success or failure is seen as a result of individual endeavors. So, you know, oh, that person's poor. Well, it's their fault. And less looking at the context. That one was clearly lazy because she blah, 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 or clearly stupid, it's sort of individualized. And then there's a school of literature which looks at capitalism and neoliberalism in particular, which says one of the ways this current economic system stays in place is through pushing blame into individuals. So instead of saying the context didn't allow this group of people to flourish, we say this group of people were lazy, drunk, and stupid. And that allows the system to continue as is. This is a very exciting um, school of thought and something to kind of maybe think about. You know, how do we individualize blame or failure or success? You know, we've got plenty of stories around this in South Africa, in particular, for example, where white people say, well, I worked really hard. That's why I got this job. No, you did work hard and the context really served you. So just, just an interesting thing there that um, the more mature we are the more contextual the more we see the context as emergent and the bigger we see the context please interrupt me if i'm going too fast or you want to add in okay so the context becomes bigger at later stages so at earlier stages our world is quite small and at later stages we can see it expand, 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 till maybe one day I can see like um, a shooting in the US impacts on my life. That, that a shooting in the US is part of my life in South Africa. And um, obviously, you need great cognitive processes to integrate that amount of data and make sense of it in some way. But, but this is enabled by maturity. And a greater variety of data. So when you're getting to those enormous contexts, you're going to have to start taking in data <laughs> in a much more efficient way than just processing numbers and linear um, kind of um, causal factors. You're going to have to start um, feeling into data, sensing data, um, and, and working with it in a more narrative kind of way. Um, and then with later stage people, um, we also see another behavior, which is this understanding that Looking at the past may not reveal the secrets for the future. So there's, there's more of a discontinuity thing. And I think that discontinuity thing comes about because people at later stages are looking at the world more contextually and more adaptively. Okay, some some big thoughts. Nomsa. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you, I'm looking at the at the first point here where we're talking about uh context coming at a late stage. Mm. And would sort of curious about would one context matter in, in terms would, would 
what I'm trying to say is that where the world is now in terms of access to information, access to knowledge, um, you know, um, is, is maturity, does maturity happen at a late stage or it happens quicker depending on, depending on where the world, the, the, the world is? You yeah. can find a younger person mm. understanding the context better now and um, being understanding to where we were as South Africans as opposed to, to people who are older, you know? I'm, I'm like thinking of, of, of context in, in terms of where the world is now instead of coming in at, at a late stage. Yeah, and I can I relate it to, yeah. Sorry, carry on, you can relate, you've got experience of this, yeah? I, I can relate it to knowledge, to information, access to knowledge and access to information. Yeah. Rather than late stage. Yeah. Well, they do say that the younger generations are going to overtake us in terms of maturity. And I think there's something there about the way they engage with the world. So yes, there is more information available. And maybe that's also a bit confusing from time to time. But um, yeah. there is an element of what information is available. Um, you know, if you're in a very isolated community, maybe you mature in other ways like spirituality or um, other kinds of practices. Um, but one of the key conditions for maturing is that you receive ideas that are different from yours quite a lot. You're challenged. It's that challenge that can help you mature. Yeah, and, and I think that is why I attempted access to knowledge and information. Absolutely. And yeah, and if you look at where we are as South Africans, uh, for young, say I would say young Black Africans, the context is also different depending on where they are. A South African who's... Um, whose parents work probably in a corporate or they, 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 they run businesses, kids go to a private school, their context is different to a black child who lives in a squatter camp, going to a school that um, has a feeding scheme. And yeah, so also in that the context matters because it can come at a later stage for that person as probably when they move through university, when they start getting knowledge and information, uh, as opposed to um, a child who goes to a private school who gets that information at an early age. Yeah. So Absolutely. access is also important. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's the poverty angle. And there are also traditional processes that might do that in communities that might offer that same kind of um, new perspectives, or maturation processes that also work. There is a big debate in the adult development community um, about the impact of poverty on maturity. Because at the moment, maturity is measured in a very sort of um, academic style. Um, and that is clearly a glass ce ceiling. And one of the aspects is access to information. So thank you for bringing that in. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Miriam. Trauma would be similar, wouldn't it? Yay! Yes, so I've got a big section on trauma yeah, coming. Right very, very, very important at the moment. I've got a lot to say about trauma. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Alistair? Julia, you, you mentioned something on the previous slide, and I see this theme quite a lot in coaching circles. You're talking about when, say, a leader is dealing with volatility. And there's, I think the conventional way of doing things is to adapt. Mm but I'm hearing people saying the more mature you are, you shouldn't adapt. You must just go with the flow or something like that. Mm. Um, can you touch more on that? Just... Oh, I've got a slide on that. 
I've got okay. some coping strategies later, including this incredible new phenomena called the jellyfish leader. So thank you. I'll definitely be getting there. So anybody heard of epigenetics? Yeah, cool. So epigenetics is fantastic. And we just don't use this idea enough in work as a coach. So the sort of scientific way of thinking about it, it's the bridge between the genome and the environment. Context can turn genes on or off. So for example, if I come into life, with the gene of cancer, I can turn it on through smoking. So context and behavior can turn it on or off. Social experiences can also change your genetic, um, you know, what is turned on and what is turned off. And so, um, and things can be cleaned up. Certain genes can be turned off if you clean up lifestyle factors or stress factors. And medicine is looking at how that can be manipulated at the moment. So this is a bit of a layman's um, look at epigenetic, epigenetics. But the idea is that context turn things on and off. And we see this in science and why are we not using the same idea in coaching? So I love this. Don't read it. It's too long. I'll give you the summary. I just popped it in from some other research. So what this research was about was that um, they wanted to understand the tone of voices heard by people diagnosed with schizophrenia. And they found, interestingly, that the tones of the voices that people heard varied enormously. So the Americans heard voices that were violent, horrible, and critical, telling them how hopeless and worthless they were. The British people often heard commands like stupid or go get the milk, or but the voices were critical and demeaning. The Ghanaians heard encouraging advice. And even when there were horrible voices as well there were always other voices that said don't worry we're going to look after you ignore the bad voices and in the Indian patients they tended to hear relatives who were often comforting but also a bit interfering you know like eat properly or clean yourself up or those sorts of pieces of advice now don't you think this is phenomenally curious that the tone of the voices heard in the different countries could vary so much. So I love to use this as an example of epigenetics, how cultural contexts can be so deeply sunken that they manifest in the voices heard by schizophrenics. Cool, it's a cool study, eh? Yeah, Kathy, colonialism in US and yeah, how interesting. Do you want to say more about that, Kathy? That is interesting. Well, I just noticed that the American was very critical, violent, horrible. British was very negative, ugly bitch. Indians were also pretty negative, um, although they had a little bit of more uh, balanced positive, and the Ghanaians were it seemed the most positive. So it made me oh. wonder about what is the what is the influence this. British colonialism has had because obviously the Brits had a huge influence in the formation of the United States, uh, obviously a huge influence in um, uh, mm. India. Uh, so yeah, South Africa, I'd be fascinated to know what the voices sound like in South Africa, given the yeah. uh, colonialism there, not necessarily as British as much, but, uh, but still very Western European. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And I know that if I want to get schizophrenia, I want to be doing it in Africa. Um, because it, and I suspect there might be something about Ubuntu in there, about how people treat people um, and how schizophrenic voices might manifest the worst of how we treat each other. And then obviously the colonial influence 
would would come in there to you. How fascinating. We could talk about this the whole day. So then we did some research for the International Enneagram Association conference that Lucille's going to present. And we started asking questions about atypical expressions of Enneagram type. So we went through a whole lot of reasons why we would come across like an Enneagram 8 who was unable to stand up for themselves, who was a puppy or yeah who was with with atypical kind of behaviors so the first thing we looked at was assessment problems so is it something around our assessment maybe we're assessing incorrectly so we've got now almost five thousand assessments we went back had a look spoke to some coaches and it 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 felt like so maybe there was some that were, as Alistair said, you know, different contexts, um, but that often people said that, you no, know, they're related to the driver. People, you know, like the Enneagram 8s, related to the driver of being strong, that was their driver, but their behavior was still quite different. So, so that might be some of, some of the explanation. Then the other bit is the cultural overlay of organizations and contexts. You know, often um, you work in an Enneagram 3 organization and even the nines look three-ish. So the cultural overlay gets internalized. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the other points, but it's really like there's a lot of pressure on people to fit into organizations, live the brand, live the values. And this has become so extreme that there's some researchers who are saying that it's an infringement on human rights to make people live the organization's values, which is an interesting perspective. And I quite like it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of pressure on people to internalize organizational culture. So another explanation was that when people move from a conventional way of making sense in the world to a post-con, often they start flipping their fixations. So like if we're staying with AIDS, the AIDS, which used to be very aggressive in order to show strength, now they kind of use softness and vulnerability to show strength. So there's a flipping. So maybe that's an explanation for the atypical behavior. Maybe there's something about stress and fallback. Maybe there's something about the confusion about what context they're in. You know, people don't really know what context they're in. You know, especially in global organizations, there's so much confusion. Like, um, so today I worked with a US brand, but I worked with the offices in Vietnam, Japan, Netherlands, and England. Now, what context are these people in? So there's this, this enormous confusion around what context people are actually operating in. Which culture do I belong to? How do I actually fit in? And then this idea of contexts in transition, which is incredibly confusing because when things are changing, we actually don't know which of the signals in the context we should be responding to. So there's a lot of reasons why people might be showing atypical expressions and quite a lot of them are related to the context. What do you think about this? I've just thrown like a huge mass of ideas and theory at you. Are you surviving? Are you all okay? Do you see what a mess we're in? How complicated it is? <laughs> So, 
you know, if we work with this idea that the Enneagram should be helping us and our clients broaden their behaviors. Oh, sorry. Not me. So we, we want to help people broaden the varieties of behaviors they display. So this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just an interesting thing. But we need to, as coaches, stop just looking at Enneagram drivers alone. Because that's going to give us some information about people. But if we're not looking at how that drivers operate in contexts, we're not actually reading the situation well enough. So we can expect more atypical behaviors as the context becomes more and more turbulent and more and more pressing. What do you think of that? Madness. <laughs> okay, all right, you're with me. Right, so okay, can, can I make a comment on that? Please do. So I'm not sure that I'm 100% convinced. Mm, good. Because if the Enneagram is, is designed in the right way, it's designed to, 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 to show up motivation rather than behavior. Mm. And I buy that the behavior might be different in different contexts, but that the motivation mm. stays the same. Yeah. So let's say, for instance, as you said, your atypical eight. Yeah. With a motivation to control, depending on the context that that eight is in, that might manifest in different behaviors. Mm. Yeah, it's exactly that. And I see your line of reasoning, and I'm sitting making sense of it and wondering, you know, a, a, so we're not saying that the motivation changes but that the behaviors that are used to express that motivation are becoming more varied mm. does that make sense yes it does so we we sing atypical behaviors yeah okay but still coming up as an eight. Is that what yeah. you said? Okay. Yeah, That's, that okay. was the weirdness for us. That's why we did this research project. We couldn't understand why the driver was clearly right in the assessment, but the behaviors were so different. Okay. Yeah, thank you for helping me clarify that. I appreciate that because I sometimes I'm not clear. I'm just throwing words. So I appreciate that. Julia, was that across a wide range of maturity levels or mostly post-conventional? No, all of the all of the assessments. And um, we don't know the actual, a lot of this is anecdotal based on, so when coaches go off, they come back and they say, but they're looking like this. Or when we give feedbacks to people and they say, but they're looking like this. And um, Lucille and I um, felt that we were seeing that, that a bit more, especially like yeah in weird place especially with aids you know especially the more transactional people yeah thank you karen so i'm just wondering we're talking about aids here but for all enneagram types we have a healthy and an unhealthy uh, mm -hmm. version mm -hmm. so then isn't that also the context so for example when the mm -hmm. eight is um when the eight is feeling uh, is in trauma or feeling uh, what's the word unhealthy, then the context changes. The context is shifted, and then um, you know, then maybe the the behaviour to support them is to allow themselves to become more vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, and that would be a lovely mature eight that would get more vulnerable yeah. under pressure. 
Mm. Um, and that would account for some of the data, but not, um, not the what? more conventional aids who might become even worse behaved. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. That's another contextual angle. See, I think it's all quite varied and quite new in terms of how we how we sort of read and see the, the context kind of impacting on people's behavior and quite confusing. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Alistair? Um, what you just said about uh, this multinational conglomerate for me just highlights the importance of maturity work in terms of moving people up the ladder um, I mean there's controversy around that but in my experience I um, just by doing a Google search mm. you could find that American companies are on this diversity and inclusion wave, right? Mm -hmm. And so I approached one of their branches in South Africa and said, oh, let's do a diversity program for you. And the head of transformation was like, no, we, we are too scared to go on that journey even though the mandate from global is that they're supposed to do it. Mm. So if you look at, you know, the maturity theory, which sort of, depending on who you talk to, which sort of says America is at that achiever stage or orange slash moving into green, um, particularly around issues of inclusion. Whereas in South Africa, we know where we, we are too scared to have some of these conversations in the corporate work workspace. So going back to what I said in the beginning now is if that person in the South African branch is aligned to the corporate strategy from the global organization, then you've got people aligned to the global strategy. But the person sitting overseas does not know that the branch here is not executing what the global strategy is. Mm. So that could be the same thing with the organization you're dealing with, that it's a global, it's a global organization, but each region is operating from a different stage of maturity. So you just have people you know, you just have headcount occupying seats and not really executing on the strategy of, you know, what the global CEO or yeah. global board wants, you know? Yeah, and I think you, it's where you where you get your data from. So, so in my experience, South African companies actually have a reasonable amount of skill, at least talking about DEI. And you might find companies in the US that, that don't. So it's all about where you get your data from. And I think um, there's always been a debate in corporates about centralizing and decentralizing. And when you centralize, you undermine performance because you become decontextualized. But then you have variable implementation like that of strategy. Um, but if you decentralize, your identity becomes a bit fragmented. It's a long debate that goes on for years and years and years, and no one can really decide what the right thing to do is. But yeah, I'll, but I'll... Julia, those people are not looking at decentralizing or centralizing from a maturity perspective. So you could centralize or decentralize as long as you're operating from the same stage of maturity, you'll get the desired results. They were not using the maturity lens. And that's why the debate goes on and on in the OD world, because mm. people are looking at it from a very technical perspective. 
yeah. and not looking at it through let's let's mature the organization as a whole globally. Now that's a different conversation. Mm. Then I we think, all yeah. then that then we then that sort of gets rid of the context issue. Yeah. Well, I don't think you can. And and I think that there's some data in in this that maybe I would want to explore a little bit more fully before I gave you my opinion. But I'd be happy to tell you in private, Alistair. I will I I'll come to, I, I, I'll come I, I to think, Tokai for coffee yeah. one of these days. Yes, I think assuming that the US corporate world is at performing, maybe wrong. It may be, yeah, but it's a different discussion. Let's chat. The context now. So, and I see we've got half an hour. So some of the things that I just wanted to say about the context that we're dealing with now is, um, and you can see it in the literature, certainly from the trauma people, from the relationship people, is that there's a great focus on self self as providing utility in organizations like i'm a tool i'm a tool of capitalism and i need to like deliver performance then there's a whole trend towards i must be authentic and i must be needing a lot of self-care um, and so a lot of emphasis on self and you can see this in coaching communities you can see it in adult development communities you can see it in blogs, you can see it all over that there's this real spotlight on the individual. Um, so that's one way of understanding that like people now have expectations that they must provide value to the world, they must also be authentic, and they must express themselves, and they must have quite a lot of self-care because they're actually quite fragile. Anyway, I'm being a bit cynical and rude here, but um, I think you get the picture. The external world, I don't think I even have to talk about that because you, you know what's going on in the world. There's a lot of chaos. There's limited leadership. There's a lot of trauma, climate change, race, all sorts of things happening. So this very turbulent external world and a very internally focused internal world. And you can see how that happens. People want to like stabilize themselves somehow in this turbulent world. And so they start with the self and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just if that becomes the only focus. So to your point earlier, Alistair. Some current approaches, and I quite, I've just thrown these together based on kind of what I've read and seen, you know, in coaching, people might say, no, just control what you can and stick to the small world that you can control. Now, this is an interesting idea, especially in the light of something like ESCOM. So there's a lot of like um, finger pointing around. So ESCOM is a state-owned enterprise that's responsible for power in this country, deeply, deeply corrupted. Um, by fraud and state capture, just for those that don't know what it is. So now this guy comes along to fix it. And so the, behind some of his thinking is this idea that maybe if I just control the world of ESCOM, it's going to be okay. And so that's where he flexes his muscles within that world. Um, forgetting that that world in ESCOM is actually part of a whole system which he can't control. And the system keeps interfering and stabilizing itself back into the organization. So whatever you try and do to fix inside just keeps getting fiddled with. So while this is a nice practical approach to dealing with um, this turbulent context um, and where you yourself can stabilize a bit, it might not solve all the problems. Then this business of trying to influence where you can, yeah, and trying to work with some of the systemic flows in organizations or the societal fault lines that impact on a person's life. 
Um, so this island, this island of sanity idea is another one where what we do in this mad context is we just stabilize ourselves and we become like an island of sanity. And if we're lucky, we find a couple of other islands as well. But this means we're not very porous and we're not very responsible. We're like separate from a context. And in my mind, that might not be helpful to advise our clients to try and be an island of sanity because then you're not experiencing the growth and change. So then this other one is the jellyfish approach. Now jellyfish love acid waters. They float along on any current. They manage to kind of keep themselves intact in many storms and they float along. So then this idea of jellyfish leadership kind of came to my head and this might be me just getting beyond myself. But if you look around the world, there's a lot of jellyfish leadership going on. Floaters, um, people who um, are not standing up for what they stand for, that are doing their best to kind of stay in a leadership role, but maybe not really adding much value. I mean, I can, can I say Boris? Can I say Biden? And I say, you know, people that are floating along in this turbulent world, and it is a strategy for survival. But is that going to, to kind of make the big difference? And how do we explore this idea with our coaching clients? Do we say to them, no, just go with the flow, just kind of adapt all the time, lose yourself? And then, so those are kind of approaches that I've seen with coaches. Um, and they're very focused on the role of the eye. So the more I think about trauma and the way trauma operates, the more I think about we approaches. Collective planning, um, nurturing identity in groups, and collective trauma approaches. So this begs the question of like, if we're trying to build leaders as coaches, how much group coaching are we doing? How much individual coaching are we doing? If, if we're going to try and build leadership for the future, where are we gonna make our impact? So are we gonna get involved in some we approaches, which might be better at dealing with the current turbulent context than I approaches. Now, this is all very complicated. So, and I, it's something I'm stewing on at the moment. And I'm looking particularly at the work of a guy called Jack Saul, who happens to be Esther Perel's husband. And, um, and then I'm looking at, in particular, state-owned enterprises and the level of trauma in these organizations. So instead of asking, like, why are these organizations not performing, we should actually be asking, how are they performing at all, given the level of trauma? And we might ask that question as well of the world. And if we're going to be working with these problems in organizations, Collective trauma might require collective um, action, collective working with context. Am I smoking my socks, Chantal? Um, I'm just suddenly making an interesting connection. Well, it's interesting for me. I hope it's interesting for you. Oh. Um, Richard Boyatzis, who's an organizational behavior guide, Case Western Reserve, He's written this brilliant piece with Daniel Goleman on personal sustainability. And they talk about the interaction between the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So the first lot of dots there is about the sympathetic nervous system. It's about defensive, like it's not the fight, but it's the flight, freeze, fawn, like let me just look after myself, yeah? It's the defensive sympathetic nervous system activation. But the other one is the parasympathetic nervous system activation, which is opening up, being available for relationship, finding safety in groups. And um, some of the trauma people, I think it is Huber, talks about settling the nervous system. 
So the dots that are the bullet points that are in your second set of, of, of bullet points is about settling the nervous system. So I just went to that really by neurobiological level of the nervous system here and the contrast between the two. I love that, Chantal. That's interesting, very huh? Yeah, and they, they um, the defensive sympathetic nervous system means you're in the limbic brain, you're all reactive. The parasympathetic nervous system means that you can open up the brain for the cross hemisphere, creative, expansive kind of thinking, which gives you many more options. So it's a very important thing. Yeah, that is fantastic. Thank you. And I'm going to to explore that some more. So so we must defend and open because it's through the opening to the context that we can develop more adaptive responses. Um, and yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I'm just worried. Yeah, we pull on time. So, so let's keep that theme going because it's a very interesting theme. Uh, here's some another big wormhole. Do, do you want to go here or not? Should we just? Anybody here interested in it? Andrea, yeah. You're an attachment pattern person, aren't you? Um, yeah, I was just going to also add to the, the last piece yeah. that trauma happens in relationship. So the unraveling of it also must happen in relationship. And sometimes it's a relationship to another person, but sometimes it's in relation to a group. Yeah. So if you're a kid and you've been bullied often by a group, then it's like, how do you find that coherence again with groups of people? Or if you're a woman who's been slut shamed by other women, for example, um, excuse the strong language, <laughs> oh, but if yeah. that's if that's happened in your world, then it needs to be healing in community of other women. Um, and it's foundational to that healing for that healing to happen. So it's 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 kind of you can't get one without the other. You can do some one on one healing with a therapist. But if the healings happened in a group or a collective, then it needs to also be healed often in that group or collective environment, a different one, but yeah. Exactly. So I just wanted to add to that. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's, ex yeah, that's perfect. Thank you for that. Sure. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy uh, to hear about uh, <laughs> attachment, I'm but I'm also happy to go ahead if you want to go ahead. I, um, I, I think I've got three more slides. So, I mean, this is just a mad idea. It's a mad idea and I'm just gonna drop the idea and run. Okay, so um, what if we could use attachment patterns to understand people's response to the context? So securely attached people are able to have a relationship within a changing context and still be themselves. Anxious avoidant, obviously there are many versions of attachment patterns. I've just chosen this sort of mixed bag one. Anxious avoidant, people tend to try and be autonomous from a context. And so are less open to adaptation, more defensive in their approach. And then the last group, anxious ambivalent, um, might be the floating jellyfish, you know, where you're constantly working hard to adapt. My question here that I'm leaving you with is, wouldn't it be interesting if we could get a picture of clients and our own relationship to the context and link that in some way to our attachment patterns and use some of the attachment pattern research to try and support ourselves and others to have a better relationship with the context. So I'm dropping the idea and running now. But, but secretly I want to know, do you think it's a good idea? Could work, hey? I'm going to go and experiment a lot more on that one. But that might be, it might be a little bit of a clue. 
Then the other thing I've been doing with clients is trying to expand their range. So, you know, you can make your own little framework and you can plot your client on the framework. So here, client, they've got a small world and they're mainly in the past, okay? So the kinds of worlds that I need to help them access might be the bigger worlds in the future. Very practical, very down-to-earth tool for just checking how big a client's world is and trying to help them make it bigger. I've, I've had some lovely experiences with this, um, in particular with like people who were gonna leave organizations. This one guy, fantastic leader, just bored as hell, demoralized, decided to resign at 60. And the organization and the world could actually use him for another 40 years. And um, one of the things that kind of happened was the expansion of his world. And this excited him so much that he's now working till he's 65. So for me, I think that's a brilliant outcome. So, you know, bringing in new worlds and compar comparative worlds. So a lot of um, Americans and South Africans are a bit inward looking um, and moan endlessly about how bad our situation is and keep providing examples of how we are the pariahs in the whole world and our situation's are worse than anyone else's. A very simple thing is like go to another country and make a proper evaluation. Like what's good here, what's bad here? You know, that's, that's another kind of context, a basic context expanding exercise that can change people's relationship to their current context often help them appreciate the current context more fully. Right, and then this is the fluidity thing that I'm bang on about all the time. Um, and just some little bits and bobs from a massive amount of research, but this whole business about staying relevant. And when you're not relevant, you're not gonna have traction in the world. So, you know, if, if what you're doing at work is getting no traction, a good place to check is how relevant are you? How relevant is your leadership style? How are your ideas? Then this other mad spiritual thing, which is like, how can we help ourselves and others see the world as it is rather than as how we are in it? Now, I know this is pretty impossible but it's something to work towards because, you know, most of our interpretations of the world all are colored by our personality, our background, and um, how far we can see. And, you know, very few of us are actually reading the world as it is. So to try and bring that idea to clients so they can work with it. Um, you know, looking at aspects of context and thinking how they can respond to it. Um, a big, a big piece of work that's coming out um, in the trauma people and elsewhere is the critical nature of creativity. Because creativity is about working with uncertainty and it shows hope and confidence and um, new parts of self emerging. So it's fantastic for working with trauma and also for keeping fluid. The other threat I often um, have in coaching conversations is a stupid little thing like, oh, how well would you do if you had to compete against chat GPT 5 or 12 or 49? What aspects of your being cannot be replicated in a computer. Stuff like humanity, creativity, strategy, vision, but who knows? Just this, you know, you, you want as many little prompts to get people to, to, to be more fluid, to have an emergent identity, to not get locked into one solid thing that was relevant in the 1970s. Work on multiple perspectives. And then the Beaker idea, which is go back to your early days and find aspects of your identity 
which may have been defiled or discarded. Integrate those identities and infuse them with pride and use them as a source for the newly emergent you. So in Biko's case, he was speaking specifically to blackness. But all of us have elements of our identity that were discarded early on in our lives. And those identities are sources of incredible emergence and shift and change. If all you work on is like if you get a dour CEO, then all you do is you work on the discarded elements. So maybe there's a blackness piece, maybe there's a playful piece, maybe there's a creative piece. Those are the bits that are the source of fluidity. So if you help them, enhance them a little bit more fully. I love this work because it allows me to play in all sorts of zones. And Andrea, sexuality, as you're going to be talking about in um, the next supervision session, is another source. And um, linking it to the workplace, I, I would um, advise you all to go and have a look at Esther Perel's work on Eros and reinvigorating life. I'm going fast because of time. And then lastly, this trauma thing. You know, I spoke about state-owned enterprises and trauma and how we shouldn't really be asking why they're underperforming. We should rather ask how they're performing at all. When we look at trauma, we see that trauma causes a loss of identity and meaning. It causes a sense of what the existentialists call ontological insecurity. We feel insecure inside ourselves. We're not sure of who we are. We become identity and psychologically insecure. And this, of course, gives us a very insecure experience of the world. Trauma also diminishes relational capacity. We don't want to build relational capacity if we're scared it's going to be removed in a traumatic way. And these things reduce our adaptive and learning capacity. So if we want to help people learn how to work more contextually, more adaptively, we're going to have to face up to working with trauma. And actually, I'm thinking all coaches need to know about trauma. Because trauma at the moment is probably one of the biggest blockages to system and individual maturation. People are not going to grow and mature if they're traumatized. So that might be a first port of call. And certainly, we, we are building leadership development initiatives that are incredibly focused on trauma because we know that is going to increase um, the, the effectiveness of those initiatives and help people free themselves up in exactly the way that Chantal described to becoming more adaptive in the world. So I wanted to have, you know, I've thrown a lot of wild ideas at you today. I wanted to have a little bit of an integration piece at the end and not just, where are you? How are you feeling? What's happening for you? I'm hoping you're not hearing the heater. What's happening for you around this? Can I come in there? Yeah, no. Uh, so. Yes, because my bitch is about to die. I'm sitting in the wrong place. Um, what, what, what is coming from me and talking about trauma, the trauma that is really not recognized and is taken for granted in corporates is the mental health trauma that mm -hmm. people are experiencing in, in, in corporate and how mm -hmm. it impacts their performance um, the way they show up and I think that is where we need to start people who have been affected and we know the stats how many people get hospitalized uh, because of uh, burnout and all those things I think for coaches that is where we need to start start uh, seeing it as trauma 
And then when we start um, um, coaching those people, we, we use this approach and, and get deeper into trauma. And if I'm saying start to define it as trauma and, and not just mental health or mental wellness. And yeah. I think we'll get some results. Yeah, I think that's the thing in the whole language around <clears throat> trauma, certainly in South African and American organizations where I've worked, it's very difficult to language trauma in a way that leaders don't take personally. <laughs> It's quite a thing. Um, and when you look at this country, you probably got like 75% of South Africans, for example, have got PTSD. And I've got the stats and I've had a good look at this. And in some sectors like mining, for example, it's much higher. But um, the, the problem comes with how do you get those initiatives into organizations? And then like we started playing with language, like do we call them wellness stuff or health things? But no, those names have been defiled. <laughs> <laughs> employee assistance programs okay. so, so we're going to have to build a whole vocabulary to kind of shuttle this stuff into organizations um yeah so thank you for that it's it's complicated and then you i mean the mental health statistics and it's so lovely and convenient that we can blame a lot of them on COVID, but actually they were already there and the intergenerational trauma When you start getting into the world of trauma and notice how it's impacting on relationships in the world, it's pretty shocking. Yeah. And, and just to share the other trauma that I've seen yeah. um, happening, it's, it's when we bring young graduates into corporate yeah. and we, we just expose them to so much trauma that uh, we, we bring them for leadership positions. We position this programs as the sole leadership, but we don't get to expose or have those pipelines. And in the next year out of the grad program, we don't see the results from the individual. We forget about the trauma that we created in that year when the person was on the program, you know, the type of exposure that we, we as corporates have um, given to that particular individual. So yeah, those are also like victims of trauma in the organizations. Yeah, yeah. Hugely convoluted. Thank you. Thank you, Nomsa. Pete? No. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Julia. I'm sort of curious and, and pondering on the relationship between what Chantel was raising and the I we styles. Mm -hmm. And to what extent is a we approach? possible if the I is the, the capacity in the I is low lovely love that question and it took a lot of listening to Esther Perel before I formed a view on that because I was very much of the view let's get the I right and then we can work on the we so then if we if we now flip into now an existential understanding of what makes a human and in, if we look at Ubuntu, what makes a human? We are only human in relation to each other. We have to humanize each other and others humanize us. And um, our identity emerges in relationship. We grow in relationship. So for me, this individualism, which is slightly tainted by capitalism and neoliberalism in whatever way, and we can talk about that, I think we've over-egged the I part of the equation and forgotten that actually maybe if we get a lot more we going earlier, we might be able to do something very useful. Um, you know, Esther Perel always says stuff like this, which is um, a lot of people, when they're looking for love, they go out and they do some self-love, they do some self-work and they you know, getting themselves into shape for love. And then um, she says, but that doesn't actually work. You've got to do that, getting into shape for love in relationship. Especially if, um, whoever it was, Andrea, you know, if the trauma was collective, the healing is often best collective. Um, it's always relational. It's always really, almost, you know, always. That's a strong word, but relational trauma. Yeah. In intimacy, especially it's in intimacy, it's always 
relational. I guess you could, if you're getting hit by a car, it's not necessarily <laughs> relational. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I just think maybe we, we must just be aware that maybe, um, I don't say get rid of the eye, but I think let's, let's up the we a bit. I don't know if that makes sense, Pete. Yeah, it does. Uh, I'm still left pondering, is there a minimum level of I required in order to enable the we? And, uh, I'll... Yeah. The, you need a self. Certainly in existential psychotherapy, you need a sense of self in order to engage with the world. So you need to have a central core. Um, but even when you've been dehumanized, there is something of the self that is always left alive, that can be reborn and grown. And this is an interesting thing also when you look at organizations, because when you look at a completely destroyed state-owned enterprise, then maybe where you want to start is not with the most wounded parts, but with the parts that survived intact. And then blossom outwards. It's just like some of the ideas we're playing with, you know, where do you go in on an SOE? I mean, there's always a bit that's healthy that you can access and that you can develop, but you do need a, a self, yeah. Thank you for that. I've got a lot written on that if you wanted. <laughs> yeah, so we've got Alistair and Jochen. Yeah, yeah, Julia, my worldview is that we have a leadership problem. Mm. I've just put the the job spec for the ESCOM CEO, and it's it's really, in my view, it's pegged at specializing. Hmm. But the complexity of the role require maybe specializing and performing, but the complexity of the role requires post-conventional traits. Hmm. So from the get-go, this person's doomed for failure. And that's what I was trying to tell some of my friends early in, in another community that it's not going to work. So my, so my question is, what if Mandela was to come back and run ESCOM? Surely the problem will be solved, right? Because Mandela was mature enough to, to handle the complexity of the role he was in. But what we are doing is we we are coaching these executives without a maturity lens. And I mean, things like trauma, for example, Mandela had dealt with his trauma to some extent, but you can't expect somebody at specializing to get into an organization like ESCOM. He's going to lose it one day on TV, on camera. And he's got, and also with leadership comes followership. Mm -hmm. Does that leader have awareness of the type of people he's supposed to lead at ESCOM in the and the political context? Yeah. So yeah. in summary, we have to be coaching from with the maturity lens if we expect the world to be better. That's my view. Yeah, I think that's great. And also some complexity requires a we, not an I, to make sense of it. I'm having that moment, Alistair, sorry. I'm taking Yeah, but because remember, as you go up the maturity scale, your sense of I gets bigger from I, we, I, we, I, we. So the more vertically developed you are, the more you see someone who's 5,000 miles away mm. as yourself, mm. right? So it's semantics when you play with the I and we, but from, rea from a reality perspective, the more mature you are, the more you care about the more you care about the world mm. or your context, the more involved you are in that context. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it could apply to any organization where you could be the board of a company on the board of a company, but you don't know what the tea lady does, how she gets to work what her experience is and all you know is what's happening in the board you know at board level but you you don't have the full spectrum of the experience of the people in your organization 
Um, and I think that's the problem we have in corporations globally. You know, yeah. we don't know the context, the full spectrum of different yeah. stages of maturity of the people in your yeah. community. Yeah, thank you. And I see Chantal's put a great book up. So, um, you know, we've got to like try and track back the trauma. We've got to understand the trauma and how it keeps repeating in different forms and the Cartman Triangle. And I think that's very useful, you know, to understand Africana trauma, Black trauma, Zulu trauma, all kinds of different trauma, traumatic experiences. Thank you, Chantal. And Jochen, you get the last say. Oh, gosh. So I just want to contribute what I take away with me from this. And in this context of the context, hmm. the question that arose that stands out for me is, who am I? In terms of all references that you have mentioned, whether it's uh, maturity or Enneagram. And I ask, what if I don't know? And will never know, who am I? So if I live with a deep unknown inside of me, rather than wanting to have a individual, which means indivisible identity, maybe that's, that's a cul-de-sac. But if I know, the immediate question is, how many am I? because it depends obviously on the context. Mm. And looking at myself as a manifold who attaches to family and party and church and I don't know what else as systems. These contexts or the context itself has no agency, but the systems that we create around them, they have agency. And all the systems together that are other than me are contexts. So important for me is what drives these systems to which we humans attach in different ways, even if I don't know who I am. And I don't have an identity myself. I attach. And that's what is quite fascinating for me historically and now. So the other question is, the last one is, how do these systems, because they have agency, attach to one another? How do they couple? And then it becomes terribly complex. So thank you for giving me the last word. Definitely have the last word. And I'm not sure if any of us can answer those questions, but they are beautiful questions to be asking. And they take us in to this issue from a completely different angle and that is hugely exciting. What happens if we try and answer this from nothingness? I can't answer it, but I'm gonna go and stew on it while I cook dinner. So thank you. Great pardon. And thank you so much for coming and getting engaged in the ideas, it's been an absolute joy and I hope you go home and think about context the whole week and good luck to you and much love see you guys later <laughs>